Welcome to a conversation with Corey Thomas, President and CEO of Rapid7, a premier provider of cybersecurity services publicly traded on the NASDAQ exchange. I'm Ken Freeman, Allen Question Professor and Dean at the Question School of Business of Boston University. Corey, welcome. We're pleased to have you with us today. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Why don't we start with your story? Sure. How did it all happen? Oh, it's a, it's a long story, so I'll give you the short version okay. uh, <laughs> of the story. Is I grew up um, initially without technology. Uh, and so I'll talk about the story as one of sort of growing up in the South, Mm -hmm. uh, but lots of it has to do with the outlet that um, technology actually created for me uh, early on. You know, like most kids, I actually love to play video games. Um, but also, like lots of kids, I like to explore. And sometimes I got into a little bit of trouble. <laughs> um, my mom, uh, fortuitously enough, actually got one of the people that she actually worked with who taught computer programming to actually let me borrow a computer and teach me how to use it. Uh, and for me, that sort of began a lifelong fascination with actually um, this unboundedness that you could actually create things that were unattached to you know, money, rules, like yeah. you, it's just your own world. And so that, that, that developed my interest in sort of like I would say both creativity, um, but also the potential of technology to actually um, reset boundaries. And so you decided to be an engineer initially, I guess. Uh, well, that was, <laughs> I did decide to be an engineer, although it was, it was out of naiveness. My, fa <laughs> my father uh, was a, 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 um, a learned electrician. And so he taught himself uh, how to be an electrician. My grandfather was a, a builder. I was the person that ran around the attics uh, and dealt with the mice when they were running wires um, <laughs> through things. And so at that point in time, I liked computers, but I wasn't aware or socialized to sort of like the degrees that you could actually, or the careers that you'd actually get. Uh, but I was interested, so what I decided to do was major in electrical engineering, which was more the power side and computer science. Um, and so I, I did the double major at that time. Wow, now if I recall correctly, you were a first generation college student, we share that in common. How did you feel, your parents, your family, uh, yourself, what an incredible achievement. How, how did that all play out for you as a first generation college? You know, it, it, it was great and stressful at the same time a little bit. So, I, you know, I worried about the debt. Uh, I worried about the, I, I got over that worry quickly. I got comfortable with it. <laughs> um, and I was having a good time. But the, it was a big adjustment. I mean, my parents were quite proud. Um, and that's great. That also adds some pressure to it. Uh, but I would say that there's all, I had lots of cousins and that was also a, um, it became something that our generation did and that we thought we should do. Uh, and so that was a great thing to actually um, help be part of what sort of catalyzed my family to sort of like do that, um, along with some of my cousins who were actually doing it in the same time frame. Wow, okay, so, so you weren't alone. There were others I was in the, not alone. In the that was extended great. family going to in college the extended too, family. which is yes. fantastic. Now, when you came out, I mean, you've done a number of very interesting jobs since you came out of uh, Vanderbilt. Uh, you also took some time to get your MBA along yeah. the way from HBS. Uh, you worked at Deloitte Consulting. You worked uh, at a firm called Parallels Inc. Yeah. You worked at a very small West Coast based yeah. company called Microsoft. <laughs> yeah. And now you're the CEO of Rapid7. How did that happen? How did that evolve? Yeah, I would say it's happenstance. Like there was not a lot of plans. So I knew a couple things when I, when I came out. One, I want to work in the field of technology. Um, and, and I've largely, by and large, done that. Um, I started off my career actually interning when I was an undergraduate at AT&T. Uh -huh. And one of the things is, and this was the original AT&T, the long distance carrier. Uh, it's different in orientation today. Old, old style phones. Old style, <laughs> like this was not the cellular sort of like thing that people think about uh, when they think about AT&T today. But what I would say is it scared me. Uh, and it scared me in, in, in this way is that AT&T at that time was before Lucent broke off, still had Bell Labs affiliated with it. And I had the pleasure of meeting some geniuses uh, in the field. And for the life of me, I could not make sense of why these incredibly smart people were not successful. But you could just see the sense of sort of like, it's not working all around. And these were geniuses. And like, it wasn't that like they were off their game in terms of intelligence. And that started really the curiosity about like how things work, how the world work, how business work. And that started my shift from sort of technology to business. That interesting. So coming out of AT&T, that experience, you said, I'm going to go get a business degree. I'm going to be a business person. I said, I'm going to try to understand. So I started off trying to get, I started off going into consulting. That's what led me to Deloitte Consulting because okay. someone had told me that like, that's a good way to learn. You're interested in learning business. This is a good way to get a tour uh, of the business world. Uh, and then I went back to get my MBA to try to figure it out. 
Um, and then someone said that you really can't understand business unless you're in one. So you should not do consulting. You should go into a business. You should go yeah. to a, a business well run. So that led me to Microsoft. Uh, and so all of these things is I'm constantly sort of asking sort of like, how do I learn and how do I figure this yeah, thing out? Yeah, and your creativity gene that you talked yeah. about earlier, going from Microsoft, now a very large company, yeah. to uh, not a, quite a startup, but, but an evolving company yes. that was relatively new and young. Uh, that must have been a huge leap to go from a company with lots of infrastructure to a company that probably didn't have as much infrastructure. It was, it was a huge leap and you traded one set of challenges for another set of, uh, uh, sort of challenges. So I would say the lack, I've never done well with rules. I don't, I don't, I don't love them so much. I don't, I don't know if many people do, but the Microsoft had a specific culture. It had things you had to leverage and it had some rules to it. And I remember someone telling me one time when I was there, and by the way, I learned a tremendous amount at Microsoft. I had a very good run there. But I still remember someone telling me that I could not be fully successful unless I learned how to use, leverage the Microsoft engine. And you know, that was true. But I remember my rebuttal at the time was just like, yeah, but what about the customer engine? What about all these things that are outside there? And that's when I knew that I had to actually go figure some more things out. And I couldn't learn in the safety of the Microsoft environment. So uh, in some ways it was too easy. And when it's more freedom. Much more freedom. Now I got a dose of the real world when I actually did that. It turns out um, freedom is nice on paper, but when you're actually trying to make sure you have enough money to meet payroll and you're trying uh, to make sure that uh, if you have sort of a bad quarter, you have, so they, there's a different yes. set of stress there. Yes, uh, you, you, there's no one else to look to. There's no one else to look to. <laughs> so Rapid7, what was it about Rapid7 at the time? You joined about 10 years ago. Yep. What was it about Rapid7 that you said, this is the place for me? People. The, you know, I met the chairman. It didn't have the most obvious technology, actually. I met the chairman though, and he said, listen, we're all just bozos on the bus and we're trying to figure it out. Um, that was a time, it's, it's not that way as much today, but that was a time when best practices were still the dominant idea. We're gonna go apply, and I keep talking to these venture capitalists, and I kept talking to these businesses, and they're like, we want your expertise, and we want you to apply what you did here, and what you learned at Microsoft, and we want you to just apply it. Uh -huh. I'm like, where's the sense of curiosity? Where's the sense of learning? And both the founders of Rapid7, as well as the investors at Bain Capital Ventures in town, um, one of the original sort of um, investors in it, they both had this sense that like, our goal is actually to explore and actually figure out the best ways to do things. Um, and that hugely attracted that me. That must have piqued your interest, yeah. absolutely. Now you started out, if I recall correctly, in marketing, is that correct? Yeah, I started off running marketing, product management, and part of the operations around customers. Um, and so it was. You a broadened and broadened, became the sales head, the COO, and president, uh, and exactly. then president and CEO. What in 2012, about in five 2012. years ago, yeah. uh, enjoying life as a private company. Yes. And then all of a sudden, three years later, you say, "Okay, we're going to go public." Yeah. And so you've been public now for a couple of years. The difference between uh, being the CEO of a private company and uh, and being the, the CEO of a public company, how would you describe the difference? Well, I think, I think there's three sets. There's one, you own your own thing. That's, you have a lot of freedom there. Although I do think that being questioned is important. And I actually think that you can, having people that are willing to question you is hugely important. Uh, and so I think there's lots of benefits um, to actually having either investors, uh, private investors or public investors. Really, the way that I think about it is I went from having a concentrated set of investors to like a highly diverse set of investors when we became um, when we became public. And we got some benefits, but what that also created was a lot of scrutiny. And I had to get better at some things. Like the, I was very good at talking to people who had context. Uh, um, and so I, you know, I tell my kids, you shouldn't live in a bubble. And it turned out I haven't lived in a bubble for a very long time. <laughs> and I struggled when we were in public about how to explain stuff to people that didn't have context and didn't understand. And that's something I had to work on. Um, and it took a bit of effort, but like I was saying, like, I'm going to get good at actually how to talk to people that don't have context and background. And certainly cybersecurity is not the, the simplest area in it's the world to be competing It's not the simplest in. area in the world at all to compete in or to explain. Yeah, now, now it's a crowded field. Yep. Uh, you've succeeded in, in differentiating the company. What, what is the source of differentiation for Rapid7? The source of differentiation is, is, I would say, a couple of observations that have been well applied. Uh, and so the first thing is that uh, cybersecurity is unlike any other industry in the world. Um, and I typically don't make categorical statements, but I, I truly believe that. If you think about every industry in the world, you have all the things that they teach in business school, um, whether it's regulation, whether it's technology, whether it's customer, whether it's competition, ecosystem, you have all that stuff. Cybersecurity is the only industry in the world where you have an active adversary. 
at the peak of your at the peak of your game when you're the best in the world as a cybersecurity company no other industry has the dynamic where every single government in the world every single corporate every single criminal organization in the world is trying to make you irrelevant because customers trust you the incentive of a trillion dollar industry is to actually make you irrelevant and effective. That's a completely different dynamic than exists anywhere in the world. And so the observation was, it's not the technology that's make, it's the ability of the organization to continue to stay relevant and innovate in that, that, that environment. So in many ways, it's the ability to stay relevant, innovate, and have people that can actually do that. So we focused, when people were focusing on products purely, we said culture drives products and basically our products need to actually evolve and change at a constant rate over time. Mm -hmm. uh, and that has been allowed us to do something that very few companies do, is that as we actually scale, um, we're able to actually change and still get better. Um, you have and a quite a wide array of, of products. We have services, quite a wide array of products, but that's built into the DNA of saying that at a much earlier age than most companies, we want a multi-product strategy, we have an incubation strategy that we built into the fabric of the company, and it's all about staying relevant in that dynamic world. Who's your primary customer? When you call on a major company, and you serve so many of the large companies and small yeah. companies, who's the primary decision maker that you're considering? I would say that's a hard thing for our sales teams. It, it, it is not consistent uh, in the industry. So sometimes it's IT, sometimes it's a security buyer, uh, sometimes it's a legal buyer. Uh, and so it changes uh, depending on the context of the environment. And so, are you feeling CEOs becoming more and more, and boards I sense are becoming much more? They're in, not the buyer, but they're the accountable party. Mm -hmm. And so we do do lots of readouts, lots of discussions, lots of accountabilities to CEOs and the boards, but they're not necessarily the selection um, body per se. Well, it's always fun to be in an industry where it's not particularly simple. Yeah, <laughs> the I complexity actually, exists. I actually you can take advantage in that sense. Now, I would say the other, the other thing that you actually alluded to when we talked about our customer base, though, was the other thing that we selected specifically was everyone was building products and technologies and services for the top 1% of companies, the Fortune 100, the Fortune 500. We said we're going to create a company that actually solves cybersecurity and data for the mainstream buyer, and so we're going to serve the 99% of companies and organizations in the world. That actually, that focus allowed us to actually have a much um, broader market uh, than most of our competitors. Have you ever thought about broadening even further to providing cybersecurity services for individuals? You know, I've, I've thought about it. I would say that it is too far afield right now. And so the thing that I look at is sort of, are the things that you learn in one domain relevant to another domain? Mm -hmm. So I would say we will provide it to individuals who are responsible for a corporation. So like we'll enable individuals within a corporation, but it's providing uh, consumer uh, technologies is a different discipline and domain. So we're always trying to figure out how do we leverage the capabilities to maximum effect. And if you look, say, five years from now, or yeah. more, uh, the evolution of, of uh, uh, the sophistication of the folks that are trying to encroach gets stronger and stronger Absolutely. and stronger, their motivations, many different forms of motivation. What do you foresee five, ten years from now? Is this something we can cure, that we can, in fact, uh, begin further reducing the number of attacks and, and, and also provide appropriate services over time? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I would say I'm probably, uh, of cybersecurity, I'm, I'm one of the few optimists in it. Okay. This is an eminently solvable problem. It does take some degree of technology. Uh, and I think we're on the cusp of some breakthroughs in technology, and I, I can talk about that. I think it takes lots of will and willing to do things differently. Um, but it's solvable. If you think about what creates, there's two things that creates most of our cybersecurity exposure today. Um, one is that uh, in, our, in our rush, which is reasonable by the way, but in our rush to develop and innovate, um, we tend to create buggy software that has lots of vulnerabilities. Um, so that's one creator of it, and I think that people are doing lots to actually improve the quality uh, of the technology that's released. But you say it's always going to be buggy at some level. The second one is that we do a horrible job of maintaining our technology infrastructure and ecosystem. If you look at the number of unpatched, misconfigured things, those are solvable problems. And the great thing about it is that people don't have to solve them. We're increasingly, like a heavy focus of our research is how do you actually take automation, which is a boogeyman word in lots of contexts. But in this one, people love it because how do you actually use automation, how do you use data and intelligence and allow computers to better maintain systems? That is a completely solvable problem. So big data, data analytics, very important to the future of the business. Absolutely. And, and differentiator for your company as you Absolutely. take it forward. Yep. Culture, you mentioned the importance of culture earlier and, and you've talked about culture in other venues as well. Uh, 
how would you define the aspirational culture of Rapid7, what you're striving to create culturally? Yeah, and so the, and so what I think about sort of culture in general, when I think specifically about Rapid7, it's that we're all on this journey where we foundationally believe that we can actually play a role and technology can play a role in actually making our technology infrastructure safer, more reliable, more secure, more productive. And so everyone believes that. So in general, we have a, a culture of optimism that this is a solvable problem, which is different. Lots of people have a culture of pe pessimism around cybersecurity. The second thing is sort of like, you know, if you think about what a culture is, it's not just sort of where you're going. Lots of it's about how you get there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the way that we believe we get there is that basically people that who not just bring their knowledge and expertise, but they bring their creativity to bear um, as part of a team that actually solves problems. And so, you know, one of the things that we talk about internally, you see if you're in an office, you see these guitar picks everywhere. And you see um, names on conference rooms, or Rolling Stones, you see a whole bunch of um, Run DMC, you see a whole bunch of names on the doors. And the reason we do that is that um, we want our people to be rock stars. And so we want very talented people that work well. <laughs> but we say we're all part of a band. And so really talented musicians know how to harmonize. And so we expect people, part of the how that we do it is that yes, we're all individually excellent, but we harmonize together. And so people that are talented, but can't actually take something that someone else done and put a magnifier effect on it, mm -hmm. uh, they're, pro they're not the right people for us. And so it's that belief about how we actually get there that really matters. That's fascinating. What a wonderful analogy you're able yeah. to put to work in for everyone. So, so as you bring employees into the company and they learn the culture, uh, do you have a leadership development process, or is it primarily on the job? Or I would say how do you historically, how do you it's been on the job, and I actually think that's been to our detriment. Uh, if you look at what uh, our chief, my chief people officer, uh, Christine Laconi, and today, and we're looking at, and we've been looking at for probably the last year, is as the company has now crossed a thousand people, and as we promote from within heavily, but also as we bring people in from the outside, our investment in a still mentoring is a part of it, but a more structured development program for leadership has been a big area of investment over the last year, and it's probably going to be one of the bigger areas of investments that we have over the next couple of years. Very interesting. And now, have you had mentors in your, along the way in your career that have been particularly influential for you, and what kind of advice did you take that said, I'm going to take this to heart? You know? Oh, yeah. I've, I've, I've been blessed by a wealth of mentors. You know, one of the things I find is that what you get out of mentors has everything to do with how candid, transparent, and vulnerable you are mm -hmm. um, to them about what's actually going on. So I, I feel blessed here. Some of the great feedback I got was, don't focus on getting the job, focus on how you're gonna be successful when you get there. Um, <laughs> I was ambitious, uh, some of us have said an upstart, uh, <laughs> and someone told me, it's just like, listen, I get it, you're gonna get that job, but at the pace you're going, you're going to be really crappy at it when you get there. <laughs> uh, and so we had to process that. And so like it was slow down, actually learn things and focus on the view, the road to getting there as the, as the things that will develop you well when you actually, um, when you get that next level job. Now you recently joined the, the board of Blue Cross Blue, Sh yes. Blue Shield of Massachusetts, which is a, another great opportunity. So you're a sitting CEO, you have your own public company, and then you're a CEO of another, of a, yeah. uh, on the board of another company, so sitting in, in the, down the hall, if you will, down the table from the CEO. Are you finding that to be of any help as you, as you continue to evolve your role it's, as the CEO? It's massive. I mean, one of the things that my board encouraged me to do it, I don't know what that says about what they were trying to tell me. I'm still trying to process that. Uh, but they say it's a good perspective building. Um, but the the thing that I that I get out of it, I was actually very cautious in, in how I actually selected and thought about it. One, I think it's incredibly, I think Andrew does an incredibly great job of running the organization. So I wanted another CEO that I could actually learn from. Uh, I wanted a different industry. Because uh, I really do think context and perspective is everything. Yeah. Uh, and so I, I want to be out of the technology industry. Uh, and I want it to be somewhere else. And I will tell you is that I've learned a wealth of things that I've, you know, I've come back and I'm just like, oh, I got to apply some of these learnings uh, into our own business. Yeah. Now, as a leader, you've evolved as a leader over a period of years, uh, post-education, post post-Vanderbilt, and then HBS. How would people that work with you describe your leadership style? It's interesting. I, I think they would describe it as um, focus on impact. Um, high autonomy, um, high um, coaching, uh, mm -hmm. high coaching, mm -hmm. uh, high collaboration, uh, and candid. Like, you know, the, the attitude is we talk about what, what matters. Um, 
I don't, uh, I don't try to, or in many ways, try to tell people how to do, um, how to do the jobs. But I do believe that we get to have rigorous debate about what's dialogue. the right thing. <laughs> you can still so have, we have dialogue. Lots of dialogue yeah, um, sure. that's there. And so yeah. I think that's how they describe it. We often in business school try to teach our students that you know failure is acceptable yes. as long as we learn from it. Are there any failures you've had along the way? If you look back, where you say, "Gee, I wish I'd done X instead of Y," uh, whether it's professionally or in your yeah. development. Oh yeah, they they happen all the time. Yeah, exactly. So like I'll, I'll just go through some of the things. So uh, I really wished, you know, we had some, in my tenure as CEO, I think we've gotten much better, but I've had some bad hires. Not a lot, but I've had like you know, two or three yeah. that were, and, you know, and they were preventable in some ways by um, doing the right level of diligence, but also doing the right level of onboarding training. So mm -hmm. we talked about that. Um, that's actually there. The, um, I had some projects that have gone sideways. So when I was at Microsoft, we had this launch that I just did a disastrous job of, where I ended up taking a, a, a demotion effectively. Uh, and it was mostly because I was focused so much on the outcomes um, that I pissed a lot of people off and no one wanted to work with me. <laughs> uh, That's a big learning. It was a massive learning. Yeah. Uh, I've had learnings uh, when I was the COO of Rapids. I was actually, I was the CEO then, about um, hedging isn't de-risking all the time. So you think about hedging as de-risking, and we kept failing in our international expansion strategy. Uh, and so we were going international, we failed again, we failed again. And, and I found a guy I wanted to lead on the third iteration. And he was, in, in his, he's at the company now, Richard. He says, he looks at me and says, I can't take the job. It's, you're not into it. He's like, you're not committed. And I said, I said, what? And he was just like, you're trying to do this with like 20 people. I'm like, that's called a thoughtful discipline, ri discipline risk. I was like, it's a discipline risk. He's like, it's not a discipline risk. He's like, it's a half ass bet. And so the, uh, and so what we talked about was what's the difference between hedging Mm -hmm. um, and actually sort of like playing the win. And, so and, and committing and committing. And committing and committing, hedging and committing. Such, such amazing, and, and we all learn from these experiences, exactly. don't we? I mean, for our students, you know, this idea of failure, even taking the risk of potentially failing, yep. for many is, is a very difficult thing to think about, perfection often being the object. Yes. But through our experiences, as you've described several of the ones you've experienced, it has made you that much more of a complete leader as, as you've gone. It's essential. You know, we just, uh, you know, we're in the process of doing ongoing, um, you know, evaluations for promotion at, at different yeah. levels. And I'll tell you, one of the things that actually holds talented people back is people that focus too much on the success rate versus the level of impact. Mm -hmm. And so we're in there and we're saying, like, it's a great success rate, but the impact's Impact poor. And so yeah. frequently we end up promoting people that actually have a lower success rate uh, or higher degree of yeah. failure, but they generate more aggregate impact over time. Sure, sure. Now, now ethics is another hot topic these days, and of course, and it links to cybersecurity. Uh, uh, in the recent months, Equifax has uh, come into play with a number of different issues and what have you. Uh, is there an ethical dilemma you might have encountered along the way uh, where you really had to, to think about your value system, what, was, what you felt was the appropriate thing to do, where you've really been challenged, where you said, you know, I've got a tough decision to make, and you've, you've weighed the variables, you've come to the decision, uh, where you might have learned from that experience? Yeah, so I have not, and it's it's interesting um, because I've been asked employees by this. I have not seen anything that I thought was an ethical decision mm -hmm. that was sort of like one of those things that they write about. So like, why did they do this? Now, what I have been faced with, and which I actually think is sort of probably more significant, is it's those daily decisions where you can actually shape um, that require judgment. Mm -hmm. um, and you can take the easy way out. So, you know, this happened, and I don't have to talk about it um, because it's not big enough. I can sweep it under the rug. Mm -hmm. And then it is sort of one of those things. Because what it feels like emotionally is, do I want to go through the hassle? And you can actually self-justify. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and what I always try to do there is just operate, you know, the, the, that old standard is that basically assume everyone knows everything. Um, then would you be ashamed of it? Yeah, um, sure. And so it is sort of an over, over disclosure, over transparency. Mm -hmm. um, and anytime you feel somewhat, anytime I feel uncomfortable about communicating, 
I say that I should probably communicate. Yep. Uh, that's the that's, that's the general. A, that's a there. wonderful way to go after it. And, yeah. and, and so often, if, if an individual goes after it, does something maybe on a small scale, if you yes. will, small becomes bigger and bigger. Becomes we bigger. become able to rationalize larger and larger issues. It can at some point be very it, dangerous it, for the company. It, exactly. And in fact, the people I've talked to that have actually have been those cautionary tales, they talk about it starting very small um, <laughs> and ballooning. Um, to, to yeah, it's really amazing how that transpires. Uh, there's no secret uh, that women, people of color, are underrepresented in the tech sector and more broadly among public company CEOs. Uh, do you feel incremental pressure as being a, a black CEO in, in this world where there just aren't a lot of uh, underrepresented minorities in the CEO suite in public company. I feel a sense of urgency to actually address it. And I would say address both sides of the equation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think one side of the equation is you want to live in a world, and I have kids, um, that actually is just and fair. Um, both in, in practice and in appearance. I, th I think both are, both are, both are important. Yeah. Uh, and so from that, I feel a sense to sort of like look at the things that actually um, create or drive the systematic thing. And this is not at all about sort of like actual qualifications yes. for things. It's about sort of like what are the things that actually take something that mathematically and statistically uh, is just impossible. Yes. Yes. Uh, and so you have to say like there's something wrong, just like if you are truly objective about it. Uh, the second thing is that to address the other side is that, you know, there's so much bemoaning um, and I'll focus on, on, the, on the U.S. for right now, but there's so much of a moaning of, um, you know, American competitiveness um, and, and jobs. And I really think that as we're in transition is more diverse teams help you actually develop a broader perspective and help you see around corners. Mm -hmm. I think one of the biggest challenges when I look and when I sit and when I engage sometimes with companies and leaders is they have too many people are the same mm -hmm. and they're all the same analytical mold and so like you know um, they lack creativity um, so the number of executive teams that I meet and they don't have any creativity any creative hormones they all come from the same background I'm like well then how can you actually run a business in the real world when basically you represent like you know a hundredth of it a narrow, uh, slice. Like, you, yeah. narrow spice and so therefore you don't really understand it and so I, I think both of those are important. Um, one's an economic driver, one's about justice and fairness. What do you do to keep yourself grounded as a CEO? CEO is a 24 by seven yeah. job in many respects. Yeah, so there's one thing that I don't do, I just get, is my family and my kids tend to keep me very grounded. They think I'm an idiot. Uh, <laughs> the greatest so, truth serum in the world. Exactly, and so that, that, actually, uh, that actually helps hugely. Uh, <laughs> and they're all smarter than I actually am. Uh, um, the, the, the second one is I try to actually have something that I'm doing on an ongoing basis that I have not mastered um, and that is new and where I'm a novice and a beginner at. Um, and so, you know, the things I've done and are still continuing on because I'm still that good is um, the slow, torturous process of learning to play the guitar, oh, which I'm wow. just awful at. <laughs> um, the, I've done martial arts uh, in that vein. Mm -hmm. Um, before as a, as, as a way to sort of like learn uh, and stay relevant. At some point I'm going to take an acting class that's on the list for the future. But I find that if you are in an environment where you have to ask for help and you have to actually look bad and you have to, it, it just, it keeps you sort of remembering. It helps so, the humility factor in a humility. major way, doesn't it? Yeah. Very interesting. If you had a, a word of advice, uh, one piece of advice for today's students as they prepare at some point to leave this place and go to the world of work, what, what one piece of advice would you want to highlight for our students? Yeah, I would say, um, I know you want the recipe. Uh, there is no recipe. And increasingly, there's not a recipe for success. If you look, uh, almost all of our major industries are going through some pretty serious transformational um, issues. And, and I think the people that are actually going to thrive in the in, in the world as we go forward are those that are going to be able to balance both the creative skill set and the executional skill set and are going to actually be able to actually learn and adapt um, better than others. Sure. And so I think it's this ongoing spirit of like, um, I think the explorer will be the champion uh, in the world as we actually go forward. Explorer, creativity, exactly. adaptable, flexible. Learning, always. And learning every single day. Yeah. Well, we've been in conversation with Corey Thomas, president and CEO of Rapid7, where we have been learning for the last 30 minutes so many wonderful life lessons and lessons in leadership. 
Thank you for joining us. And Corey, thank you so very much for being with us. Thank tonight. you so much.